in God's house on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost, but it's also our Rally Day Sunday. So it's exciting seeing all of you uh, with us again here today. And we're delighted that we can join our voices in praising and worshiping our Savior, and our Lord, and our King. And uh, if you're visiting with us today, we extend our hand of welcome to you as well. Look forward to getting to uh, a chance to meet and greet you uh, after our service today. Well, speaking of uh, Rally Day Sunday, according to the dictionary, I looked this up, the word rally as a noun means a mass meeting of people showing support for a cause. I think we should check that off, right? That's what we're doing here today. We've gathered together as a group, again, as I said, to praise our Savior, Christ Jesus, and to grow in our faith and to be strengthened in that faith so that uh, we can take Christ out of the sanctuary into our daily world, our world. The word rally as a verb means to recover or cause to recover or renew in health, spirits, and poise. Well, again, that's what we're doing on this Rally Day Sunday as we gather together once again after a summer of trips and vacations and uh, weekend visits to the cabins and all the other activities that go along with the summer months. And now we have come together again to be renewed in our Christian faith and fellowship. And so on this day, but <clears throat> it's really a goal for every day, we want to be solidly grounded in God's Word. And we want to do that by growing in God's Word. So that's what we're going to talk about today in our sermon. We're using the corral service format, so everything is basically in your bulletin, uh, except for the hymns, obviously. And so we'll begin with our opening hymn, Hymn 231. And so let us begin in the name of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to whom all hearts are open, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Amen. Let us bow, let us bow me, in spirit and confess our sins together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions 
and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your punishment both now and forever. But I am truly sorry for all my sins and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Do you believe the word of Christ's forgiveness that I speak to you is from the Lord himself? Receive then the forgiveness Christ won for you by his passion, death, and resurrection. By the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I, as a called and ordained servant of the word, forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so we pray now together. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and are able to offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you and a reflection of your presence in our growing faith. May the life that is to come give us the fulfillment of all that you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We turn now to the written word of God, and our Old Testament lesson is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, beginning with verse 4. And this is what Moses declared to God's people as he spoke on behalf of the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Paul speaking to the Christians there in Philippi, but remember he's talking to us as well. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tendency, tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even 
death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of our Lord. Today's gospel lesson comes to us from Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, beginning with verse 16, and I invite you to rise for the gospel reading. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of our risen Lord. Let us now confess our Christian faith as expressed in the words of the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue then with our sermon hymn, hymn 230.
God's amazing grace and his divine peace be to all of you. From God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I mentioned on this rally day, we want to focus in particular, and you probably noticed that from the scripture readings, on Christian education. And in doing so, I've chosen to look at just a couple verses from John's Gospel, verses that I know you are familiar with. It's printed in your bulletin, and I'll not make you rise. It's just a short a couple of phrases here. But Jesus, again, was speaking to the people, and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then a little further down, he says to the Jews who believed in him, If you hold to my teaching... You are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Thus our text, let us pray. Lord Jesus, out of your truly amazing grace, your undeserved love, you have blessed us with saving faith through word and sacraments, setting us free from the death and punishment of unbelief, for which we thank you from the depths of our hearts. We pray that you would enable all of us to be shining lights, reflecting you and your love to this darkened world that we live in. And make us always eager students of your word throughout our lifetimes. Bless the word as we hear it today, and may it strengthen our own discipleship. In your name, Lord, we ask and pray these things. Amen. Well, dear fellow followers of our Savior Jesus, here we are, another rally day, which tends to mark the beginning of a new season of activity here at the church. And as I just mentioned, the primary focus of that activity is Christian education, which is simply another way of saying that our focus is on growing in the word. Now I know you've heard me say that phrase many times. I'm sure you've heard it from other pastors too. You've heard me talk about the need and the importance of studying the Bible, feeding upon its words and literally inside your faith growing. But why, someone might ask. Why is it that that's such a big deal? I'm sure if I were to go around and ask all of you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again from that death, defeating sin and death and the devil and promising you everlasting life? I would be very surprised if anyone answered, no, I don't really believe that stuff. Now, it could be. I don't know everybody's history. I don't know everybody's heart. But I would really be surprised. So, someone might be asking, Pastor, if I know that stuff, why do you harp on all of us to keep studying the Bible? You know, knowing that the Israelites were God's people, that the Israelites walked across the Red Sea on dry ground, that Jesus, he was able to feed five 10, maybe 15,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. (laughs) That's all fine and good. Those are great stories. But, you know, none of that stuff really comes up in my day-to-day activities. So what's the point? Well, think about this. If you do, in fact, truly believe in Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, then you know what I say? Praise the Lord. Because if that is your heart's belief, that means that a precious miracle has taken place in your life. One of many, no doubt. Because the Bible makes it clear that no one could believe that without the Holy Spirit intervening, breaking through the deadness of your own sin, and filling your hearts with faith and life. And the Holy Spirit performs that miracle through word and sacraments. 
And of course, the sacraments are always connected with God's word. Otherwise, they're not a sacrament. But simply believing in Jesus and then just leaving it there actually confuses the reason why you were saved. Listen again to Jesus addressing the people and also addressing us. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, there's a tie-in between followers of Jesus possessing the light of life and darkness, which envelops the whole world. And I know that may sound a little strange, talking about the Bible and darkness. And understand, I'm not saying that they are synonymous or that one equals the other. On the contrary, the one brings us and keeps us out of the other. Listen to how the Apostle Peter describes it in his first letter. He says, you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You ever think about that? You ever think about yourself as being those things? So you are all of those things through faith, but then he goes on, he says, that you may declare the praises of him, Christ, who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So I go back to the question we were asking earlier. If I know these things, why is it so important to study God's word? Why is it so important to actually grow in our understanding of the scriptures? Well, the answer is because our gracious God not only saved us through those words, rescuing us from the darkness and the deadness of unbelief, and brought us into his wonderful light, he did that so his word, his light, would shine brightly in our hearts, shine brightly in our lives, and shine onto the lives of others. We're not only, we've not only been saved, I should say, for eternity, but we all have a mission, every one of us, to bring the gospel to others. That's why God's word is so important, and it's why, by God's grace, his church will always proclaim it in all of its truth and purity and beauty. Because that's what gives light and life to all who hear it and believe it. Now, at one time, darkness played not just a major role, but the only role in our lives. No one has any kind of spiritual light in and of themselves. Rather, by nature, all people walk in darkness, the darkness of sin. That's why Paul would go on to declare in his letter to the Romans, there's no difference, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Because we're sinners. And what are the wages of those sins? Plain and simple, death. Physical and eternal. Read Romans chapter 6. Without exception, all of us were conceived and born sinful, and as such, totally deserving of God's punishment, which is not only death, but eternal condemnation and punishment. We've all inherited a sinful nature, which loves darkness, by the way. So we got a part of us that is drawn to that darkness all the time. And it's the reason why no one ever had to teach you to be selfish. No one had to teach you to lie or cheat or slander or gossip. And we could just go on with all the, the vices, right? It just comes natural because of our nature. Because of the sinful nature that we're all born with. So when we confess our sins, as we did just a few moments ago, we know it to be true. We are sinners, and we don't really deserve anything from God but his wrath. Because we're all guilty. And yet, we've gathered here this morning without that fear of God's punishment in hell, which our sins, we readily admit, deserve. 
But we're not here in fear because of God's amazing grace. Listen to Paul speaking to the Colossian Christians. And again, take this personally. He says, when you were dead in your sins, which is another way of saying that you were lost in the darkness of sin, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing all of it to the cross. You and I were on our way to hell. But God canceled our sin debt and the eternal punishment that those sins deserved because Christ took our place on the cross, taking our punishment and taking our death, but then rising from that death alive and granting forgiveness of every single sin to all who believe in him. And with that forgiveness then comes the promise of a new nature, a brand new spirit-led life here on this earth, as well as the promise of everlasting life in God's heaven. Through God's word, the light of Christ penetrated the sinful darkness of our hearts, as Paul told the Colossians once again. He said he rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his Son. You see, here's the good news about God's word. It not only creates faith in our hearts, but it sustains that faith. Now, why is that so important? Well, you see, the moment, the very moment that we are brought out of the darkness of our sin through faith in Christ, either at our baptism as a child or maybe later on in life where God's word has been shared and the Holy Spirit using that word to create faith, at that very moment, Satan paints a bullseye right here on our hearts because he wants us back. You've heard me say it before, and I want to say it again. Satan has two goals for every believer of every generation. His first goal is the one that he most desires above all else, and that is to destroy your faith. He wants to lure you away from God's word and to have that flame of faith within the believer's heart to go out. Now, he can't snatch you out of God's hands. He's not powerful enough. So he lures you away from your faith due to the lack of fuel. And we easily see that. You know, you go camping, you got the lantern there. What happens when the lantern is out of fuel? The light goes out. Satan wants that most of all. He hates Christians with a passion, and he burns with anger because Christ was the one who came along against Satan's will and took believers away from him. And that all happened by the power of God's word through faith. So he wants all Christians back. And the Bible tells us, unfortunately, it is possible for a believer to lose their faith. How? Well, I, as I mentioned, Satan does that by getting the believer to focus his or her heart's attention on the world and away from from the word, away from the fuel for the light of your faith. But then comes the second goal. And while he favors the first one, he probably has the most success with the second goal. If he cannot destroy your faith outright, then he seeks to destroy your witness so that you do not have a gospel impact on anyone else. He wants you to be so weak in your faith that you, well, you don't look any different or much different than the rest of the unbelieving world. So he 
in a sense, seduces you into talking like the world, acting like the world, thinking like the world. And God's word has little to do with your daily life. You haven't chucked it all, but it's not very prevalent. And see, remember, that's how the gospel comes to the hearts of others. Someone shares it. That's how you came to know God's gospel. Someone brought you, most likely, most of you anyway, to the waters of baptism, which, as I said, is connected to God's word. Or somewhere along the line, someone shared the gospel with you later in life. Because no one is born with faith. And you can't catch it like a cold. And no one decides to become a believer because apart from Christ, we are dead spiritually in our sins. Faith happens solely through God's amazing grace who uses his holy word, the scriptures, to create faith, yes, and to sustain that faith that's been planted in your heart. So that we can have, yes, the certainty of going to heaven one day when our life is over on this side of eternity. eternity, And, and it's a big and, just underline that in your thoughts, so that we can have a gospel impact on the lives of others. That is what we're supposed to do with the gifts, the various gifts that God has given to us. And that is how it works. We are brought to faith through, or life, excuse me, through faith in Christ, brought to us by God's word, but not only to be saved ourselves for eternity, but to bring that gospel light to others so that in turn they can do the same thing and bring that gospel to others so that they in turn, and it goes on and on and gone. And if you were able to look in your own history, you would find that's what happened in your life too. People way back brought the gospel until it finally came to you. Now, some people have what we call the gift of evangelism. Those are people who just seem to have a natural knack to engage people directly with a gospel presentation. I would venture to say that's not most people, but it doesn't take away our mission. Others may have a a humble and quiet demeanor that causes them to be noticed by their confidence in the midst of all the storms. And someone may even ask them, where do you get that confidence from? Why aren't you afraid like everyone else? And then a door is opened. Growing in God's word, no matter where you're at on that spectrum, strengthens your faith and gives you a quiet confidence that everything is in God's almighty hands while the world around us is crumbling in all kinds of chaos. And I really don't have to convince you of that, I don't think. All you got to do is look around. There are people right now who are deathly afraid that World War III is right around the corner because of that war between Russia and Ukraine. And speaking of Russia, they'd like nothing more than to see our demise. And so would China. And Iran hates our guts. They'd love, love nothing more than to see the United States fail. And then you've got North Korea. They want the same thing. And all of those countries, and many others, they've got nuclear weapons. We've got wolves on all sides. And then, look at the world. We have the devastating fires there, like in Hawaii. We have earthquakes, like just happened in Morocco. Volcanoes, tsunamis, ravaging floods. It's going on all over this world, killing thousands upon thousands of people. And now we're hearing that COVID is back. Oh no, another pandemic. There's drug shortages, not the illegal kind, the kind we all use for our health. And there's food shortages and gas shortages. Say that six times fast. And inflation, it's killing our household budgets. And now we're hearing that the government wants to go cashless. And we'll just all be using digital money. The government controlling all of our money. What could go wrong with that? 
And even though I've really just touched the tip of the iceberg, like I said, I'm not telling you anything you don't already see. The world is a mess and growing more and more ungodly and intolerant each and every day. But in the midst of the wind and the waves that are crashing around us, hello Peter and the other disciples in the boat, growing in God's word is an essential part of the Christian's life because it keeps you focused where your focus should be on Jesus, which in turn keeps the flame of faith burning brightly within us. And that faith-strengthening word fills our hearts with confidence, knowing that we have indeed been set free from sin, from worry, and from fear by the truth of God's word and the power of God's word. And there's more. Because we're also given his divine peace that goes well beyond what our minds can produce. It's that wonderful peace of knowing that our gracious and almighty God is at the helm, safely guiding us through all of the storms of life until one day, heaven will be our home for all eternity. But until that day comes, now, is the time for us to be growing in the most amazing word that the world has ever had the opportunity to know. But the world won't know it unless we share it. And growing in God's word will open doors for you to share that good news of Jesus with others with whatever gifts God has granted to you personally. And so my challenge to all of you this morning is to make the most of every opportunity to hear and learn God's word through your regular worship, through the Bible studies that we offer here, but also through your own Bible readings and devotions at home and maybe on the road. Because by the grace of God, you have been saved and we have our marching orders, as the Apostle Paul tells us there in Ephesians 5. He says, once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And then here it comes. He says, live as children of the light. What's light for but to shine in and through darkness? So dear ones in Christ, for your sakes your children's, your grandchildren's, and maybe in some cases, your great-grandchildren's, and for the sake of others around us. Now more than ever, as the world becomes more ungodly, boy, do we need Christ. We need him in every part of our lives. And Christ wants that too. He does indeed come to us mightily and powerfully and graciously as we grow in his word. And as his devoted disciples, set free to be growing disciples, may God's word truly be a lamp to your feet and a light for your path. God bless your growing. Amen. Please rise for the benediction. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, that's that divine peace I was talking about earlier, may that peace keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen Christ. Amen. You may be seated. At this time then, we traditionally uh, ask that you would make your presence known through our worship participation cards that we have here, uh, in the, or that you have in the pew there. Um, if you're visiting with us and you'd like to know more about our ministry here, then give us information, address, phone number, email, whatever, uh, that we can get that information to you. If you're a member, remember, you can't, <laughs> a member, remember, I'm a poet, didn't know it. Um, you, if you have prayer requests, or if you can write that on there, we'll pray about it during the week. 
or if you have uh, changed information, let the office know that too. Then you can put that in the offering plate in the back of church after the service. So uh, at this time, as I mentioned, with our emphasis on Christian uh, education, I'd like to invite our Sunday school teachers. I don't think Mary, is Mary still here? Or did she have to go in the kitchen? Okay. Well, these words will transfer from here all the way into the kitchen. But I'd like to have our Sunday school teachers come forward at this moment. And we thank God and we are blessed uh, on their willingness to teach our young people. I don't know if you remember when I first got here, we had one student in our Sunday school and he was a first grader and I had to tell him now for our Christmas program, you got to be Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. <laughs> so you might want to be studying your... No, I did tell you that. I'm teasing. All right, well, dear sisters in Christ, you have come to be placed as teachers in the Sunday school of this congregation, a work in which our Father in heaven has great joy. You are to assist the ministry of the word and sacraments by instructing God's children according to his holy word. You are to prepare yourselves for this work by your individual and corporate study of the word of God and the faith drawn from it as it has been delivered to us in the creeds and confessions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. While holiness of life and work is the way of all who trust in Christ, it is especially important that you show yourselves by word and by example to be patterns of good works and Christian devotion. In the presence of God and this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept these positions entrusted to you? And do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting in Him, conforming yourself to His word, in accordance with the faith of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, answer, I do. As servants of the word, I then place you as Sunday school teachers of Gloria Day Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty and most merciful God, our Heavenly Father, enlighten and strengthen you in your office that you may be good and faithful servants to the glory of his name and the salvation of his people. And so we pray. Grant, O Lord, to these, your people, the gifts of wisdom and discretion, kindness and faithfulness, so that they may effectively teach and guide. And grant to all your people a ready willingness to learn. Let the knowledge of your word be preserved and extended among us that all may know you and from the least to the greatest praise you now and forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in the peace of the Lord, the almighty and most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you. We continue then with the prayers of the church printed in your bulletin. Everlasting and merciful God, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look in mercy upon your church, protect it and sanctify it by your truth. May your word be taught in its purity and your sacraments be rightly administered. Grant unto your church faithful pastors who shall declare your truth with power and shall live according to your will. Send forth laborers into your harvest field and open the door of faith unto all unbelievers. In mercy, remember the enemies of your church and grant to them repentance unto life. Let your protecting hand be over our country and over all who travel. Prosper what is good among us and bring to nothing every evil counsel and purpose. Protect and bless your servants, the President of the United States, the Governor of this state, our judges, 
and all in authority. Fit them for their high calling by the gift of your spirit of wisdom and fear, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. According to your promise, O God, be the defender of the widow and the father of the orphan. Relieve and comfort the sick and the sorrowful. And we pray now, Lord, that you would hear the prayers and the petitions that come from the hearts of your dear people. Lord, we humbly thank you that we are able to provide faithful instruction of your word for our children, our young people, and the adults of this congregation. We thank you for giving us devout Christian teachers who give unselfishly of their time and efforts in the blessed work of teaching your precious lands. Abide with them and through the Spirit's grace increase their faith, enlarge their knowledge of your word, and strengthen their zeal to teach. Through the same Holy Spirit, maintain a good attitude in our young people and our congregation at large, that we all may desire to learn your word more deeply and then demonstrate our faith and our love by the daily lives that we lead. Graciously help those who are assaulted by the devil and who are in peril of death. Be the strength of those who are suffering for the sake of Christ's holy name. Grant that we may live together in peace and prosperity. Bestow upon us good and seasonable weather and bless us with upright Christian counsel in all that we undertake. We especially commend to your care and keeping this your congregation which you have brought, bought with a great price. Keep from us all offenses and bind us together in the unity of your holy love. Grant that the little ones who are baptized in your name may be brought up in your fear. At your table, give to those there who there commune with you peace and life everlasting. Be merciful, O God, to all according to your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. When our final hour shall come, grant us a blessed departure from this world, and on the last day, a resurrection to your glory. Grant us your peace, O Lord. Amen. And now we pray together as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For our closing hymn, let us join together in singing hymn 236.
And now with believing hearts receive our Lord's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Very good. Well, again, we're happy that you could join us this morning in our worship and praise of our Savior Jesus. And it is always our prayer that you have been strengthened in your faith uh, through the proclamation of God's Word and that you also receive encouragement from the fellowship of fellow believers. Uh, our thanks to, to you, Nancy, for providing the music for our worship service and to Mary, who I think is in the other or in the kitchen there helping getting some things uh, prepared for our afterwards our festivities following our service we're grateful to both of you and for blessing our worship with your talents uh, by way of announcements you'll see there's a number of them there in the bulletin uh, continue to bring your aluminum cans we're collecting them uh, we do have a note there about our food box it's down that second hallway there if you've never seen it before uh, near the coat racks and certainly any donations for that are certainly welcome and then it gets eventually or periodically uh, taken to uh, the food shelf meditation books are in booklets are on the back uh, or the back table uh, thank you for uh, those who have uh, volunteered to be uh, counters uh, there's still a couple openings it looks like in december right so Take a look at that if you haven't been able to help us with that and see if you can uh, fill in. Same with the hostess sheet. Uh, check that out. We appreciate everyone who provides some refreshments uh, for our fellowship afterwards. Our Tuesday morning Bible class, just to uh, remind you, is starting up again, not this Tuesday, but a week from this Tuesday at uh, 10 o'clock. We haven't really gotten that far, so if you haven't been in that class before, you're not going to be really uh, behind. Uh, go ahead and uh, come and join us as we're studying the book of Revelation. Uh, school board meeting uh, this Thursday. And you can see Trish there is in charge of the meal. I didn't see her here today because I was going to tell her I wanted my steak medium well. No, I know it's not going to be a steak. Anyway, good old pizza usually. Oven pizza. And I just pretend that it's a steak. Okay. And then, of course, all of you are invited uh, to join us after church for our Rally Day uh, potluck. We've got tons of food, and I know they're out there grilling the burgers and hot dogs right now. And so it should be a good time, and we have uh, a couple of surprises, too. So come join us, even if uh, you maybe forgot or didn't bring anything. Don't worry about it. Plenty of food, uh, I'm sure. So please join us. And I guess before we go... Um, I didn't tell him that, but you can tell him when, if you go back there. Let's go ahead and offer a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, how thankful we are for your word of grace and salvation and for the privilege of growing in your word and sharing it with others. Thank you for our congregation, and we pray your blessings and guidance upon each and every member. As we begin this new season of activity here at Gloria Day, enable us as a congregation and individually to hold to your word and be a beacon of light and hope to our community and throughout the world with fellow believers as we make the most of the opportunities that you provide to share your love and your salvation. Let your gospel light shine brightly in our daily lives and always in the life of this congregation. And we ask your blessing on the food that we're about to eat and on the hands that have prepared it so that it may nourish our bodies and enable us to serve you in thought, word, and deed. This we pray in your precious name. Amen. Well, be sure to greet one another before you leave here, the, uh, the sanctuary today. And again, I do enjoy, uh, or I'm calling on you to come and enjoy the rally day festivities in the hallways. Excuse me, in the fellowship hall. I know where I'm at. And uh, as always, may God bless your daily walk with him.